Thank you very much uh, for the nice uh, introduction and also to the organizers uh, for this brilliant uh, conference. I must say I was very happy with the uh, previous session because it also prepared a very nice stage uh, for what I'm going uh, to talk about, which is uh, uh, EU agriculture in the uh, bioeconomy. And it has been mentioned several times already uh, this morning that uh, the European Green Deal is one of the major policy objectives of the current European Commission. And there are important objectives uh, to be reached with the European Green Deal, including no net emissions by 2050, decoupled growth uh, from resource use, and no person at no place left behind, which of course is quite uh, a challenge. The uh, EU Green Deal policy include a number of other policies that are related uh, to, for example, uh, addressing the COVID-19 pandemic and more. All in all, the European Union expects that until 2030, they will spend about one trillion with support from the private sector on implementing uh, the Green Deal. Now, there are a few uh, policy strategies that are related and directly affect the agriculture sector and food production. They include the farm to fork strategy, biodiversity strategy, but then there are also some uh, strategies that are more on consumer demand, which have an indirect effect on uh, producers. These are eco design policies, including sustainability labeling, and then the carbon border adjustment mechanism, which, for example, also affects the imports uh, of fertilizer and uh, this has also already been discussed in the uh, uh, previous presentation. Now, if we look at, at some of uh, the details of the farm to fork uh, uh, strategy, which includes re reducing fertilizer use, reducing pesticide use, banning hazardous pesticides, uh, increasing organic agriculture to 25% uh, in the European Union, and uh, many uh, other activities, also uh, qualitative ones. Um, for example, when we look here at the... Um, I hope the laser works. Uh, oh, it doesn't. Um, the uh, uh, current level is about 8.5. So that means uh, almost tripling the production of organic agriculture in the European Union. You can see that some countries are already very high in organic production, for example, Sweden or Austria. If we look at Lithuania, it's um, about 8.1% uh, at this point in time. There were always these comparisons with the other Baltic states, right? If you look at, at Estonia, uh, maybe that can be an example. I'm not so quite sure about this, but at, at least Estonia has a, a relatively higher level of uh, organic uh, production. Now, um, when we look at the uh, levels of organic production and what is possible as organic production, this increase to 25% has become one of the most critically debated uh, policies of the European uh, farm to fork strategy. Um, well, there are some diverse figures when we look at the productivity of organic agriculture. If you look at the Netherlands, for example, about the uh, productivity per uh, utilized agricultural land area, it's uh, almost uh, four times larger than what we observe in many other European uh, countries, including for the organic sector. So, for example, if Lithuania would be as good in agriculture as the Dutch are, right, per utilized agriculture area, they might, if they would move to organic, they might be even uh, uh, much better than they are with the conventional production uh, today. So that seems to be a possibility. But one needs to be very careful uh, with the production possibilities that individual countries have. One has to look into the details of the organic sector. If you look into the Netherlands, what are the organic products they are producing? These are these niche crops, high valuable uh, uh, vegetable and, and other uh, crops. That might not always be also the case that other countries can uh, uh, produce and have the means uh, uh, for the uh, production. But also if you look at conventional agriculture, there seems to be possibility for, for growth there. Of course, one has to take into consideration that the environmental implication that 
in some cases have been linked with increase in agricultural production uh, need to be taken properly into uh, consideration. Now, the farm to fork strategy itself is a strategy of the European Commission. Basically, legally speaking, Lithuania could just ignore. Nobody is directly for things. This. Now, why it becomes important for the EU member states is through the common agriculture policy. And for the common agriculture policy, member states now have to submit their national strategies to the European Commission. And the European Commission assesses whether or not the national strategies do make sense. And for assessing the national strategies, they have to be in line with the farm to fork strategy. And that's why the farm to fork uh, strategy becomes now important uh, political impetus. The, um, when we look at the impacts of the uh, farm to fork uh, uh, strategy, a lot of debates whether or not what Europe is currently doing is enough or more should be done. And meaning to say enough is the question is to what extent externalities that we have observed and discussed in this conference several times are already integrated, priced in, in our current system. We have a lot of fertilizer regulations, pesticide regulations and more carbon dioxide emissions regulation. The question is if we further add additional policies, are the effects of these policies justified by the benefits that they may generate. And this is where we have in the European Union uh, a big debate. Now, if we look at the farm to fork strategy and what are the economic implications under the current situation in the European Union, and there have been a number of studies being done to assess them, on the uh, producer side, so on the farm income side, the results are somewhat mixed. Whereas general agreement among all these studies, that this will result in a decrease in the gross domestic product and mainly paid by the consumers. And that is, under the current situation, something we should be concerned about. And there I refer uh, to the presentation of Martin Wolf of yesterday. If those policies will mainly affect consumers, that buy food, and low-income households are the ones who have the highest share on food expenditures, and they will be affected. And then from a stability point of view in our society, this becomes something of a concern. Further, the if, uh, objective of the farm to fork strategy is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Unfortunately, not many studies have really tried to identify what the effects on greenhouse gas emissions will be. What studies show is that if we just look into the European Union, yes, greenhouse gas emissions or the global warming potential goes down within the European Union. This ignores, if you only look at those uh, figures, that there are effects that are translated into other regions of the world. As economists, we speak about leakage effects. These need to be considered, and the leakage effects are positive in the sense that it will result in increase in greenhouse gas emissions in other parts of the world as those countries will step in to compensate for the reduction in food production expected by the farm to fork strategy. Now, if we factor this in, then the study shows that about 11 uh, units or 11 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalents will be reduced. So still a positive from a global warming potential perspective. This study did not explicitly include what we refer to cha uh, emission changes for land use and land use change and forestry. They could, were not able to properly assess this. If this will be included, which is changes in land use that may result in Latin America, in Africa, or in Asia due to expansion of agriculture production there, then the authors conclude that the farm to fork strategy would not result in a net greenhouse gas emission reduction, 
but may result in a greenhouse gas emission increase. This is something we should be concerned about. This is just one study, and we have to be careful. All models are wrong. This is always what I tell my students. Right? They are simplification of reality, but we need to get more insights about what is causing the emission effects, in particular with respect to farm to fork strategy, to also be able to more properly identify responses that may offset potential negative effects. Now, we had a big EU project called Biomonitor. David was one of the advisors to the project, where we also looked into the bioeconomy strategy of the European Union and tried to identify what may happen under a business as usual scenario that is the so-called gecko model, model of the European Union on uh, energy use. And then included changes in the prices of fossil fuels, 30% and 50%. You could think about this as being a tax on fossil fuels. And what this may mean to some of the objectives of the bioeconomy strategy of the European Union. All that is in red means negative, those that are in green means a positive effect with respect to some of the key indicators we identified with respect to the objectives. So ensuring food and nutrition security, not surprisingly, we find a negative effect. If we look at managing natural resources, sustainability, sustainable, again, the effects would be negative for the European Union. We get a positive effect when we look at biological renewable energy production. That would increase. If, oops. if we look at mitigating and adapting to climate change, there we would observe a positive effect within the European Union. And if we look at strengthening competitiveness and creating jobs, there we also, on several indicators, we observe a positive effect. But the picture is mixed, and one needs to be very careful uh, with the implications. For example, a carbon tax, a general carbon tax on fossil fuels, um, may have with respect to the overall objectives, for example, leaving no one uh, behind, uh, may have. The picture is uh, quite mixed. Now, what we conclude uh, from this is that we need a change in the policies that we currently observe in the European Union. What we have at this point in time seems not to be good enough to achieve the objectives of the Green Deal. Now, what we then did is looking into the possibility of changes, and we developed a model of a supply chain similar to the model that uh, David is using, where we have first an R&D phase, we have a phase where new technologies have to go through an approval process, for example, for low-risk pesticides or new plant breeding technologies. We have a market phase when products are sold on the market and an exposed liability uh, possibility when uh, companies may uh, face uh, legal charges. Now, the time frames we have uh, modeled as being uncertain and what we were interested in seeing, okay, for each unit of investments in R&D and in approval, how many units of benefit a company would need to justify immediate investment? So for those uh, who are familiar with economics, we applied a, a real option uh, model. And these are the results. If under the current situation, we fix this uh, time length, f each time length to 10 years, then the rate is 14.59, which means for each unit of irreversible investment in R&D or approval cost, a company would need 14.59 units of benefit for justifying the investment. And that is a disappointing or disturbing uh, result, as this seems to be, this is extremely high and illustrates to what extent within the European Union companies may have a disadvantage if we have other regions of the world 
where R&D costs are lower, R&D phases due to policies are shorter, approval length are shorter. And that is, for example, illustrated if you uh, reduce the time length from, five, from 10 to 5 to 2.5 to 1, which, for example, in R&D is possible uh, when we talk about plant breeding using new plant breeding technologies such as CRISPR-Cas, which substantially reduces R&D time. In many countries, there are no extra additional approval methodologies to be applied. Again, if you reduce these approval policies, the hurdle rates substantially decrease, having a substantial effect on the incentives of the private sector to invest. As we need these investments for being able to change our policies and having solutions available that allow us to come closer to the objectives of uh, the Green Deal. Now, I added here a slide on Lithuania. So how does Lithuania look at new technologies? And these are voting results at the standing committee and at the council with respect to GMOs. They need to go through an approval process. And if you look here at uh, Lithuania, the one in red, green and purple indicate where Lithuania either said voted against, abstained or did not vote. Abstaining and did not vote basically counts as no. And unfortunately, Lithuania seems not to be, the government of Lithuania, very supportive uh, to these new technologies. And my pledge here to the audience is that I hope that uh, the policy view in, in Lithuania may become more positive uh, towards uh, new um, technologies. Uh, with this, I'd like uh, to conclude. Now, looking at the farm to fork strategy, Results are diverse, but overall resulting in a negative effect. Farmers may gain, consumers pay the price. For achieving the Green Deal objective, more than we currently observe needs to happen. This requires institutional change. The mindset of those that are involved in new policies has to change. And the European Union has to do uh, more on how they regulate new technologies. They have to become more open to those regulations. Thank you very much.